Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we are going to be taking a first look at the Great War Western Front demo, which is available right now in Steam Next Fest. Uh, so you can actually download this for free and play it as well if you go to their Steam page for this game. It is being developed by Petroglyph Games and published by Frontier Foundry. Uh, and when I say we're taking a first look, we've looked at the game a little bit already, but what we're going to be looking at today for the first time outside of like the preview event where I kind of did some snippets of the, the campaign. We're going to be looking at the campaign, which is available as part of the demo. Now, per my understanding, the campaign in the demo is the tutorial, which is a couple of turns. And then the um, tutorial ends and then you get to continue playing the campaign for three or four additional turns. Uh, the campaign takes place or the tutorial takes place because the regular campaign has early war starts. But the tutorial version of the campaign uh, takes place in 1918, so you get tanks and all that jazz. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and play that. I believe you have to play from the Allied point of view. So let's go ahead and jump into the campaign. And here we can see we can choose the tutorial here, which puts you in the shoes primarily as the Americans, although it's kind of the Allies in general. Uh, you can see the tutorial has eight chapters in it. Um, plus, like I said, the ability to continue afterwards here. Uh, but you start off with the Americans arriving in the uh, spring offensive for the Germans in 1918, and then uh, you kind of go on and learn different core mechanics of the game, uh, if you will. So we're just going to go ahead and jump in. The Americans arrive. America remained neutral for most of World War One, supplying supplying aid but not taking part in combat. However, Germany's increased attacks on American ships began to sway many in the government, and the British revealed. The Zimmerman telegram to the Americans, uh, in which Germany offered to return American territory to Mexico if they'd become allies and attack the U.S., it was the last drop. By the way, is <sighs> were the Germans, like, that remarkably out of touch that they thought, like, oh, if Mexico invades the U.S., they will have a chance of retaking the American Southwest in 19, like, 16 or 17? Is Like, were the Germans that out of touch? Did they think... That was even remotely plausible or was that just like a fuck it who cares just go attack him and distract him even though we know you're gonna get absolutely crushed <laughs> brain for it i guess the german front office was pretty pretty silly hey hey d d irks thank you welcome Think about my age and joined up when i was 17. looking back I was just a foolish boy. Yeah, but the populations and the economy size is major. Like, there was no chance. Had sunk our ships and trying to turn Mexico against us. And they had to pay. My platoon arrived in France in April of 1918. General Pershing organized our troops. My unit was assigned to... Don't worry, French dude. For training. <laughs> I don't think... I don't think Germany had to do anything to turn Mexico against you. I don't think... Mexico thought very much of the U.S. at this at this period. But they also were powerless to do much about it. All right. Um, bonjour, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Andre Lorient. Welcome to France. I understand you are eager to fight, but the Western Front, uh, the trenches, are no place for the inexperienced. All right, so this is the beginning of the tutorial. We'll go through some stuff that we've talked about a little bit in previous videos or streams or whatever here, but... This is the advisor overview on the left side uh, for the tutorial, general information. Okay. So this is the map, if you will. It's a hex-based strategy or war game map, if you will. Blue is the allies. Central powers are red. Front line is this line here between the two sides. National uh, sort of, I guess, morale uh, or national will is up top here. So if either side drops to zero, that side loses. Right now we're both at 125. Basically, it represents fighting spirit, if you will, uh, on, on the home front and in the armies. You can also win by taking the capital of either side. So if the Germans take Paris or if the Allies take Kreuznach, and I'm mispronouncing that, I'm sure. But this is where the German headquarters was. The map doesn't go all the way to Berlin, but at least in this case, it's either Paris or the German headquarters. Use WASD keys and whatnot to move around the map. You can see it's pretty much most of the Western Front. The channel's kind of barely up here. 
So you get up into like the corner of Belgium that isn't in German hands, if you will. And then you get like down here. I don't know if this is technically Switzerland over here. The map kind of doesn't really say, uh, but it, it goes just, I don't know, whatever hex this is. It doesn't, I don't see a name on these towns. But yeah, select Paris. Every region has a certain number of stars uh, that represents sort of the defensive value, if you will. In order to reduce a, a hex's stars, you have to win a battle like decisively on that map. So you're not just going to take Paris in one go. You're going to have to fight multiple battles in Paris to take it uh, to sort of overwhelm the defenses. I'm curious if the actual battlefield is the same, like if I win and I reduce it from five to four stars and then I fight again in that same hex that same turn with an attack from an adjacent hex, am I on the same exact map? Because I think that could be a little bit odd if that's how they handle it. Uh, but in any event, I think it, it does a decent job of sort of representing the fact that like a breakthrough takes more than just like, oh, you took the front line lines of trenches or if you will. Uh, different regions have bonuses, so Paris, for example, lets you deploy troops there because it's the French headquarters and then also has the National Command HQ. These are the units down here. In the Paris Hex, you've got two uh, two French air wings, uh, two French tank battalions, and four French infantry corps here, so the little X. Typical NATO symbol for infantry, the circle or, I guess, oval, typical signal for uh, for armor, and then you've got sort of the... Figure eight for the Air Force units. So the initial objective here in the tutorial is to move three American corps to Chateau Thierry, move two French tank battalions to Chateau Thierry. We'll get some additional gold and national will for doing so. Gotcha. All right, so there's the objective. This is where we want to move them to. And we're going to bring the infantry from the American deployment zone, which is at Les Murugs. Uh, we've got six cores here. We're going to just do three initially, so we'll click on these six cores here. We'll select three to move, and then we'll right-click where we want to move them, and they'll move uh, to that hex. You can see they stack on top of the other existing units already there. Now we'll click on the map, and you can see this hex now has three American cores, three French cores, and a French air wing. You can also see that the region has a reduced morale disunity of command i'm assuming that's because we have some american and some french units there so the allies have some different perks and penalties for having multiple nations in their alliance the germans don't um so for for what it's worth it looks like this region also has 660 supply with a pipeline of 600 additional um the supply for the entire front is 2000 down here in the lower left so the 660 is basically what the units bring with them into fight. The 600 is what's pulled from this 2,000 figure down here. Uh, so presumably that's like 1,200 supply that we'd get to fight a battle with. Uh, we also have 6,000 gold. I'm sure we'll get to all of that here in a moment. We take a look at the objectives on the upper right here. You can see we've moved the three American infantry corps. So we've accomplished one of the two objectives there. We still have to move the armor. So we'll go ahead and move to Paris. We'll select the two armored units in Paris, and then we will move them to that objective. And now we've accomplished our objective, which gives us this gold bonus and national morale bonus, or national will bonus. So you can see that number went from 220 or from 125 to 155 up there on the top, uh, representing our national uh, will score. And then you can see the supplies increased from 6,000 to 6,700. Now this kind of hand-holding where it tells you like, hey, if you move these units, you'll get this supply bonus. That is largely for the sake of the tutorial in the core of the campaign. You will get different objectives, but it'll be more along the lines of like inflict, you know, heavy casualties on the Germans or break through and take certain hexes. So things like that, less so like move these basic infantry units to this other this other spot on the map. Um, so we've got another objective, reinforce French troops at Montmirail and capture Chateau sur Marne. We have two turns to do that. We'll get plus 30 national will. It looks like we'll also get a U.S. armored battalion. So if we click on the uh, the objective here, what did we need to do for that again? Was it reinforce it? 
Um, but now this is walking you through like espionage. So if you want to learn more about the enemy, their objectives, what they're doing, where they are, you click on this uh, intel button here. There's espionage, there's intel, and there's counter intel. So we went ahead and we did the espionage. Or intel, I guess, or it's underway. Your first espionage mission used each turn will always succeed, but each subsequent one has increasing risk factor, a chance to fail. If you get a mission failure, your gold is still spent, so it costs us 270 gold for that mission to uh, be run. Um, but because it was our first for the turn, it automatically succeeds. Additional ones could fail, and you would spend money uh, fruitlessly if they fail. So to click on the objective here, the espionage tells us what the enemy has on this hex. They've got four infantry cores, or I guess four conscript cores, two regular cores, and a German tank battalion. And now we've got to go ahead and try and reinforce these other guys over here, right? So take the remaining American units Stand by for orders. and move them here. And now we're going to go ahead and purchase a new unit. So you've got gold down here. You can spend that to buy new units. So we're going to go ahead and buy French tank battalions. What do we need to do? Buy two or one? I can't remember if it was two or one. I, I take it it was one. I think. Now we're going to move the aircraft here. Or are we going to purchase them? I'm not even paying attention here. Aircraft are gained from the purchase menu like tanks. Air wings contain fighter bombers. Select the aircraft stack in Paris. Okay. And then move on to Montreal. And now the game is going to walk us through supply. So we've sufficiently equipped our frontline trenches. Now we'll uh, now we turn to outlying support for Mount Morel. So select the hex. Uh, we can purchase siege artillery here. Siege artillery units are, are units that uh, do not appear on the battlefield. Instead, they allow you to use sink siege bombardments in battles. They don't affect the disunity of command. Any siege artillery still in the region when it's captured will be lost. So they're kind of off map artillery, if you will. There is on map artillery as well. So go ahead and use the counter intel. It'll cost 300 gold. It'll remove any active enemy espionage mission in the target region and prevents new ones for the duration. Each effect removed or blocked reduces the duration by one turn. Okay. Success. Unlike other espionage missions, esp or counterintelligence does not suffer from risk. It always works, uh, but loses duration when it succeeds. You also need to do things like build supply depots, which is kind of interesting. Like that's a level of depth that I wouldn't have expected in a game like this. So you can see here the region does have 900 supply, but if we want to draw additional supply from the map here, right now Montmorel only is pulling 400 supply from this global total down here in the bottom. Uh, you build a depot. So it's got a level one depot, I guess. So we'd increase it to level two, which will increase the supply pipeline to 600. It did cost us 900 gold to do that. So it was, was kind of pricey. But I do think that's actually a really neat mechanic in a game like this because so many games like this ignore the logistical side of things. And especially when it comes to World War I, if you're talking about trying to drop lots of artillery on the enemy, that consumes a ton of resources, or it did in real life. And so your ability to sustain continuous offensives, continuous bombardments, both in battles and on the strategic map, like if we try and fight in one place, we try and fight in another place, there's only so much supply to go around. And by pulling supply from the, the global supply, you could very quickly find yourself in a de facto shell crisis. The game doesn't break out shells from other types of supplies like bombing raids and reinforcements but it does still sort of factor into a general sense of the ability to maintain large-scale attacks and offensives. You can see structures, so there's additional structure types. Uh, I believe this is probably like an airdrome, a hospital, a repair center. This is a supply depot, other things like that. That increase your effectiveness in different hexes and, and battles and whatnot. Chapter 4 is a defensive battle, so we're about halfway through the tutorial already. Uh, but we believe uh, we were as prepared as we can be. The game is turn-based, so right now it's May of 1918. We end the turn, and then the bad guys go. So the enemy AI is the same actions as we do. They move troops around, purchase supply, plan attacks, and research new tech. Your ability to see what the AI is doing will depend on our espionage missions. Um, and for the most part, we'll be able to see what they're doing. 
So the enemy is spying, I guess. We got like three different pop-ups here on different hexes. Just like a human player, the AI will probe with espionage to see where your units are weak. You can use this as an indication of where attacks will happen. So yeah, if they're spying in places, then that's an indication like, hey, they're probably going to attack there. And now we can see here the game is bringing us forward to a battle at Chateau Thierry. The Germans are looking to attack here. Looks like some conscripts, some regular infantry, and then some raiders or, or maybe stormtroopen. They've got some air units, some heavy artillery, and some tanks. We have 1,260 supply available to us. No terrain modifiers. The, bat the game is saying the battle will likely end in stalemate. AI can attack your territories on its turn, which will put you on the defensive. Each front, the line between the hexes use a different map. Do they really have a unique map for every single one of these hexes? Because that's pretty cool. This shows you what units are being deployed. We kind of already talked about that a little bit. Battle fatigue, no one's fought yet, so fatigue is at zero. Likely outcome is a stalemate, which favors us as the defenders. They can't take the hex unless they get a, a great victory, if you will. Then it gives that information we already talked about. Core supply, max supply draw, and total supply available. Likely outcome... And the game is suggesting that we auto-resolve or engage in battle. So we're going to engage in battle, I guess. Apparently we're bringing 2,000 supply with us now instead of the 1,200. I'm not sure. I, I wasn't paying attention to see what why we get that extra supply. I wonder if I had clicked on the auto-resolve the time before, if that would have worked. By the way, Major Stranzer, thank you very much for the follow. Or, not the follow, the, the sub. Appreciate the support. Okay, so now the game's going to, like, walk you through building trenches and things like this. So you do need to build up your defenses and whatnot in the pre-battle phase. We've already got a pretty well-defended hex here. You can see there's barbed wire up here. That's what's represented by these little X's. We've got balloons at a few different locations. We've got machine gun nests already positioned in a couple of different places. We can shrink the mini-map or expand it as we wish. We can move around WASD or using the mouses. Trenches do per or persist between battles. So, you know, uh, your first time fighting in a specific location, the battle will begin with few pre-placed trenches. You're free to use them or replace them as you see fit. Any trench you build will remain in place all in all future battles in that location unless they are destroyed or you lose control of the region. Objective, objects such as weapon emplacements, artillery batteries, observation balloons, and barbed wire do not purchase between battles and will need to be rebuilt each time. Oh, that's kind of like... Mm -hmm. I feel like machine gun emplacement should persist. I don't know how I feel about the rest of the stuff. Gotta remember to like build the balloons each time then. Just like the player, the enemy trenches are also persistent between battles and can be updated during pre and battle phase. I'm curious if the um, shell craters and stuff persist. Like if we fight on a hex multiple times, obviously trees and things get cut down when we build trenches, but like, will they, will the, will the territory gradually become a moonscape over the course of the war? Cause that would be really cool if that was true. Okay. Control points are obviously the objectives that you want to take and hold or, or just hold in different battles. So you can see A here is a control point. They have a radius that you need to have troops in to control around it. There's also a command HQ over here. Infantry assigned to the command trench are completely immune to damage from the outside. Uh, kind of probably like being in dugouts and things like that. but you can charge into the into the trench. Also supplies. Uh, the total supply you have is, is determined by the number of units in the supply depot in the region on the world map. 25% of your total available supply is reserved uh, for when the battle starts. So you always have some supply for artillery and fire. So you get some supply that's sort of protected from you being overly zealous. Uh, we've got different trench types down here. So you've got basic firing trench, improved firing trench, advanced firing trench. So we'll click on this. The little triangles on it indicate the direction that the trench is facing. So we built an improved trench. And it wants me to build a second, which I don't know like where I would build that. It doesn't even let me move around on the map here. 
at the moment, just because it's the tutorial. It just feels a little bit like a waste. I don't really want that trench. I'd link these two, but they're too close together, I guess. Do I really have to build another one? All right, we'll do that. You can upgrade previously placed trenches. I'm assuming by holding that little upgrade button. Comms trenches link different trenches so you can move units between trench lines. Blockhouse trenches are bunkers. They're immune to incoming artillery, but you can't actually use them to defend. So they're kind of like, again, like blockhouses. You can also build machine gun nests and other things like that to make your defenses stronger. Obviously you wanna, if you can, you wanna make those in machine gun nests have sort of fields of interlocking fire. So um, when we were holding that, you could see like there were radiuses, if you will, of, of fire. Standard and reinforced reinforcement. Okay, so there's like trench mortars and things like this. We can add barbed wire. Razor wire is the most deadly cousin to barbed wire. It acts as barbed wire, but also damages enemy units that pass through it. Balloons exist and give you, you know, better, better line of sight, if you will, into the enemy positions. And then down here in the lower left, there's a command cap. So you can only command a certain number of units um, in a given battle. So like you have a maximum number of companies you can field at any one time. As you take casualties, though, you can add new units. So now it's going to have us pick some uh, oh, no, artillery. So artillery exists. It's immobile, but you can use multiple abilities such as like precision bombardment, rolling bombardment, those kind of things. So it wants us to take a, few, a heavy artillery battery here. We're going to put it behind the first line of trenches. In theory, it's a little exposed, but keep in mind, artillery only has a certain radius that it can actually like reach out to. So if you're too far back, it may influence how far they can actually shoot. So we place those two heavy artillery battalions. We actually have a lot now. We've got five of them on this map. And now it's going to have us deploy troops. So allies uh, have different bonuses for the units. So there's nationality bonuses for different countries. The Germans do not have a nationality bonus. Instead, Germans can use conscript infantry and have other variations in their units. So they have different unit types. When you start a battle, you have to deploy troops inside a trench. You can't deploy them in the open. When you call reinforcements in, you can uh, place them in the open. So keep that in mind. Seven American units, huh? Every trench line can have up to two units in its particular trench. I, I don't know if both fire on the enemy as they advance, though. All right, so there's our seven American units. There's also specialty units like Raiders, which can fire when they're outside the trenches, so regular troops cannot fire from outside the trenches. Raiders can fire from outside the trenches. There's no pre-battle bombardment, I don't think, in this one because we're on the defensive. All right, can I not? Yeah, I guess I got to begin the battle. I can't call in more troops I, I would have liked to have called in more reserves but in any event continue all right during the transition to the tactical battle phase all the objects you placed are built and the troops you deployed will be in the trenches normally the battle clock will begin countdown but we've paused it for the tutorial and will automatically do so even when the gameplay is resumed to give you time to read and react the transition phase includes any days of siege bombardments that were purchased in the pre-battle for both players. Bombardments have a chance to destroy pre-placed trenches and the men inside them, as well as any nearby emplacements. So you can do like pre-battle bombardments. I believe if you're on the offensive, I don't know if you can do that on the defensive. Uh, red are the central powers, blue are the allies. You can see up here is the relative strength icons. So things are about even at the moment. Both sides also hold one objective. There's a battle timer of 20 minutes. Some battles, I feel like that's a little bit on the short side. You can see a victory bar up here as well. And then uh, we can also click on a different point on the map to sort of go to that location by these letters up here. Okay, regions. Each control influences are part of the map. 
Control point that is lost or contested cannot be reinforced from. You can see the map sections. Okay. Reinforcement points down here. We have a certain number of units we can call in based off of like our units that are already pre that are already in the hex. So we've got up to 52 American infantry. I guess they're technically companies, but I like to think of them as battalions. We've arrived and, await orders. and the game's paused right now. Go ahead and play. And you can do different game speeds too. All right, so things are underway. Our troops are coming onto the map. You can see this is one of those bunkers here where they're invulnerable to enemy artillery. The reinforcements are coming up. Clock is counting down. Are balloons up? I'm not sure. You can see here's the enemy trench line out this way. And we can use different speeds and whatnot to speed things up or slow things down. Lots of our trenches here, by the way, are completely unoccupied, which makes me a little uneasy. Although I don't think the Germans are going to attack on our left flank. We do have some machine guns over there. The, art the other thing with the artillery, the machine guns fire automatically, but the artillery only fires when you spend supplies to, to cause it to fire. All right, didn't they all arrive? What are we waiting for? Hello, the troops are in place. Let's spread our line out a little bit. How long do we wait? There are different types of artillery in ours. So they have light artillery, which acts as sort of a harassing uh, fire. It also prevents the enemy from shooting at you while the while the artillery is hitting them. That's more representative of the French 75. And then you've got the big heavy artillery guns down here, which are probably more like 155s or whatever uh, that would pound uh, the enemy, enemy trenches and, and, and inflict more casualties. I'm kind of curious here if there's like some kind of... My troops arrived, so is this is I played this once before and I did not have to wait this long. Is this a a bug? Should something be happening? We have new orders. We need to hold this Let's just go get these guys killed. Maybe that'll It doesn't doesn't let me do anything up here. No, it doesn't like I can't click this button. We have new orders. Let's go get this German the balloon. This it's like the game didn't realize the troops arrived. All right, so we're going to go attack. Oh, they're going to die. Lol. Okay, game, let's go. This is a demo. Uh, shift T increases game speed. Let's try that. Oh, I went backwards. I paused things. Shift D, sorry. Or shift N. There we go. I kicked it out of there. All right, so different units have different formations, so you can... Have units in column formation, which makes them march in big blocks. They're very vulnerable to fire. You can do skirmish formation, which kind of spreads out, and you can you can have troops halt. All right, units have different have vision requirements, if you will. You can only see so far out into the uh, into no man's land, but you can raise or lower your balloons to uh, increase your line of sight. Yeah, it's real time. 
So now that we raise the balloon, we can see like, holy crap, there's a lot of Germans out this way. Those are the guys who killed our troops. We can also use our artillery here to launch different types of bombardments. So this is heavy artillery. All five of our batteries here are heavy artillery. You can do gas attacks with them, air bursts, or precision barrages. All right. So precision barrages fire a tightly packed series of shots for the uh, for average damage. They suppress enemy fire in the target area. So we can you can see this line here represents what its uh, radius of fire is. So we can't actually hit anything over here. We can go ahead and drop them. Here. And it's based on where they're placed on the map. So we call this barrage in at sort of the max of their range. You can see those shells come in. I love the sort of like, I don't know, V shaped explosions with artillery. You can see it dropping in craters here. All right, so artillery then has a cooldown, so you can't use it for a certain period of time after using it. And again, it consumes supplies, which are down here. So this precision bombardment uses nine supply. We're drawing it from 1,300 down here. Meanwhile, the enemy is bombarding my frontline positions here and inflicting losses on the defending troops. We could move these troops inside these blockhouses, which would make them safe from enemy bombardment. But obviously, if they're in the blockhouse when the enemy troops arrive, we won't be shooting at them. So that's something you got to also keep in mind. Health and morale. Morale is... Or health is green. Morale is white of your troops. Morale inf can influence, like, if they're going to surrender, things like that. Health obviously influences if they're going to get wiped out. Um, you can't get more health in the middle of a battle. Any casualties that you take in battle are permanent for the rest of that battle. None of my troops here really lost too many men, but it does want me to withdraw a unit here from the battle. Withdrawing frees up a pop cap, so it reduces our population impact down here, um, and it does not count as a defeat with respect to score or objectives. So we pull these guys out, and it's sort of a free withdraw. It doesn't count as, like, if you surrender units, then you actually lose more points. Observe the battlefield. So the Germans are moving troops through their trenches. Presumably, they're about to set up a an attack. I want to shift because we got a little bit of a gap in our line. Oh, okay. Normally, enemy units and trenches can't be seen moving unless you have a near, uh, unless you have infantry near the trench lines. Raised balloons can see into trenches from much further away due to their elevation. Enemies in bunkers are invisible unless you enter them with your own infantry. Okay. So trench movement for safety and speed. Garrison infantry prefer moving through connected trenches. Over open ground of po versus over open ground if possible. We'll move this raider here from this left flank over to the right. And then rolling barrages are a line of artillery shells set in an order. These shells not only damage and suppress everything along the path, but also drop smoke. You can use this uh, to both damage and give your troops cover, which they will follow behind. So you can see the slowly uh, progressing line of artillery shells. It didn't do a whole lot of damage to either of our frontline troops here, but it did move It did move past us here. So the German troops are about to go over the top and leave uh, their trenches to assault us through no man's land. Machine guns are going to obviously open up on them and influence them. The barbed wire up there will slow them down. We can also drop artillery if we decide we need to go ahead and do that. Trenches have two positions, the firing step, the left banner position, and the reserve, the right banner position. Only the firing step position can fire on oncoming enemies. You can swap the trench position button uh, to swap companies between the positions. This is useful if you want more damaging specialist infantry to take the step while the enemy closes range. All right, so now our objective is to defeat the incoming enemy troops. We we'll probably use artillery against them if we want. Bring it in! Oh, you're going to shoot late, aren't you? Oh, there you go. Right into that mass of troops. You can see some of them are flying around. But now these shells are all wasted because they're already passed. So we can drop another barrage in. And again, it costs nine supply for each barrage. You can see here we drop an artillery right in the middle of these guys as they try and advance through the barbed wire against us 
Meanwhile, they're also getting chewed up by these two MG units that have sort of an overlapping field of fire. There's also some MGs over here. And then our frontline troops on the firing step are also shooting at them. All while they try and advance through barbed wire without any real, you know, means to do so. They didn't, they didn't bring tanks or other things like that. There are more enemy troops coming in here, so they got a pretty large group of uh, soldiers here. Another four units. Artillery arrives pretty promptly, and you can see that it does pretty damn good damage to these units, especially if they stop as they try and move through these uh, through these wires here. So those units are just being wiped out. Now, obviously, in real life, not every single unit guy there would probably be killed. You can see the enemy's launching light artillery strikes against our machine gun nest to, to prevent them from firing. That's what those little uh, sort of pinpricks of artillery was. You can also call in tanks. They give a morale bonus, I guess. The light artillery doesn't damage our, our machine guns too much, but it does prevent them from firing. That's what this little circle the line through it means. Kind of, kind of. There was mass tank use in, in several offensives in World War One. It wasn't obviously the efficient sort of blitzkrieg of World War Two, but it it definitely existed. And it was instrumental in, in breaking through, too. There we go. We're going to drop that arty on him. That wasn't that effective. All right, our MGs are still in place. Our infantry here are also in place. They're going to try and get through the wire and fail. Die, German scum, die! Apparently our machine guns on the left flank would wiped out an enemy unit. They just keep coming. More and more of them. Uh, my tanks are getting blasted to pieces by enemy artillery. Wasn't paying attention. An enemy air units incoming, so we should get fighter air superiority, I think. To protect our balloons. So that costs 60 supply. They're fighters that come in here to deal with the enemy air units that might be approaching. It is Sebastian, but it is the tutorial. So keep that in mind. Where are you guys flying off to? All right, you're not going to get past there. Artie, Artie, Artie. Oi, oi, oi. Gotta love it. I love how they're like stopping to get through what I assume is the remnants of one of those lines of wire. And they already just pulverized them in, in while they tried to do it. Infantry feels a little underpowered in this game. Like, you gotta be very precise to actually make it to the trench lines. Not that, like, you know. I mean, troops made it to the to the to the trenches fairly regularly. All right, so the enemy can offer a ceasefire. So during the battle, you have the option if the enemy offers you a ceasefire to end the battle as is. Or we can deny their ability to end the ceasefire and then we can launch a counteroffensive, which we could throw away victories and success by launching a counteroffensive. On the flip side, we could accomplish a great deal if we launch a counteroffensive. For the sake of the tutorial, um, it wants us to end it. Kind of yes and no, Mr. Unique. 
right, the battle's over. We've achieved the success, but lost the day. I assume it just means like daylight. Sweep. We have pushed back the enemy and taken ground. The people at home will see this as success, and hopefully we didn't really take any ground. We just held our ground. So you can see here the battle debrief screen. I can't see anything because this guy's in the way up on the top left, but you can see it was a sweep. Um, these are the different victory possibilities. So it's the opposite of great loss. It was a great victory, I guess. Um, central power casualties, 3,100 conscript infantry, 3,100 basic infantry. So we get 500 points for that. Uh, we didn't take any objectives on the map, so we get nothing for that. We lost 567 infantry and two light tanks. Those light tanks are worth more than the conscript infantry. Jeez. Uh, battle honors, command medal granted to those that overwhelm the enemy against all odds. Life medal granted to those that preserve the lives of their men. Efficiency medal, me uh, medal granted to those who do a lot with little. So basically how much supply we used uh, and those that preserve the lives of the men. So I guess this one is on the German side. They didn't lose two. I'm not really sure. You can see battle detail, which gives you like, oh, that's kind of cool. There's like a whole bunch of information here. And then there's company replenishment costs. So it'll be 367, 373 gold, I think. If we lost everything, maybe? I'm not really sure what the minus 18 means. Okay. National will impacts. Map. Result of the different units here. Go to world map. Did you know infantry companies can use their grenades while moving, even when moving through a trench line? A great victory! After the battle, you will be presented with the results. In most cases, the cost of the battle will be gold reserves to pay for unit replenishment. Supply that was spent during the battle and national will, depending on your win-loss event. If you, if you or the enemy achieve a great victory, the defending region may have lost a star as well. Okay, so you can see national will goes up by 10 for us, down by 23 for the Germans, and we spend... Again, I don't know what the negative 18 is here. Do we spend 18 gold or 373? All right, battle results. And there you have it. Enemy movement. So, like, we know they're moving units around the map. By the way, thank you for the follows. Uh, ZY Lurk, Ken Doodles, and Moet. All right, so the new turn begins, and that means we get research and gold reserves that we can use. So the game has a pretty extensive uh sort of tech tree if you will that you need to unlock things so stars regenerate if they didn't have a battle fought there fatigue is regenerated as well you occasionally get different pop-ups based on like events so in this case it's saying like hey we uncovered something do we want to tell the world or do we want to keep it secret? If we tell the world, we get the research and then also improves national morale. If we keep it secret, we get gold rather than national morale because no one knows that we, we successfully uncovered some, some research. The Germans or the oppo opponents could also get your research, I guess, if you publicize it. So we can go in here and see the tech tree. This is where you spend research. Uh, you can see there's engineering, logistics, intelligence, infantry, flight, and trench sector categories in the research. Or I guess nodes, if you will. So you can see if we hover over here, trench engineering, unlock like different levels of trenches. You can unlock long range explosives, high yield explosives, concrete pits, storage tents, wartime donations. Uh, intelligence, care packages, enemy inspiration. Infantry can unlock improved helmets, which improves soldier health. First aid tents, which you can build on the map. Uh, triage tents, which are better versions of those. Um, different types of units, like you can unlock elite units and whatnot. So presumably that's like to represent late war units 
having some specialties, especially true amongst the German sides. Future DLC, 13 separate is Hanzo sets. Oh God. There should be an Italian DLC where it's one battlefield that you just have to keep playing on over and over again. You're not allowed any other map. All right, so Death From Below unlocks the ability to perform an undermining attack in the field. So like when units dig trenches under, or not trenches, but tunnels, put explosives under the enemy position and then detonate it. So that's cool. We'll do that. And now it's going to have us fight an offensive battle. So the enemy has not been idle while bolstering our forces. Our spies reporting the enemy activity in the target area. The enemy AI will not sit idle while you move your units around on the map. So multiple direction attacks. When trying to capture enemy regions, try to attack the region from multiple fronts on the same turn. This can result in multiple star reductions and adds multiple levels of battle fatigue to the target region. Remember that each of your regions will also suffer a level of battle fatigue that the enemy can exploit. Okay, select Sozan. Right click on this Chantal Somarn. Likely result is a stalemate. The attack allows you to see what units will take part in the attack. An active espionage ability will increase the availability of information. You can fight the battle out directly or auto-resolve. If the results in your question or you aren't going for a great victory, direct battle is generally a better choice. Direct battle? Does that mean like when you play it yourself? All right, it's a stalemate, but it wants me to auto-resolve, so we'll do that. You can see both sides lose national morale. Both sides spend supplies and gold. Recap, select the hex. So we already attacked from here. We'll click on region morale is negative 10. Our post battle fatigue goes up, but presumably that means the defender's post battle fatigue also goes up. It's going to want us to convert some gold to supply. So it's kind of interesting where you have to like choose how much of your economy you want to put into supplies. But it did give us more supplies here. And now it wants me to attack again. This time out of Montmirall. Now it says it's likely a minor victory, but we can engage the battle ourselves. Because these German troops have already fought once, their battle fatigue is 15. Ours is zero because the units that are participating in this attack have not fought yet. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for this first look at the campaign in the tutorial for the Great War Western Front, available now via a demo for free as part of Steam Next uh, Fest through the 13th and coming out with its official launch on the 30th of March, 27th of you pre-order. Uh, this is a real-time, well, you don't need to know because we played it, so you, you watched. Uh, but I hope you guys enjoyed the video. We will finish this tutorial and play through uh, in some subsequent videos. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Leave your thoughts below. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer, as always, saying thank you very much for watching, and until next time, I'm out.